Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Abraham, and I'm from the Eccles Centre for American Studies at the British Library. And it's my real delight to welcome you to tonight's event, which is, in effect, a launch of Hannah Rose Murray's superb new book, Advocates of Freedom, African-American Transatlantic Abolitionism in the British Isles. For those of you tuning in who don't know what the Eccles Centre is, we are a research centre based in the British Library that is charged with supporting learning and enjoyment of the cultures of Canada, the USA and the Caribbean through the collections of the British Library. We do this through a variety of means, including public events like this, um, schools workshops, academic collaborations and a programme of funded library fellowships. And as Hannah Rose Murray is a past Eccles Centre Visiting Fellow at the British Library, we are particularly thrilled to be hosting this event for tonight. Uh, Dr Hannah Rose Murray is currently a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow um, at the University of Edinburgh, and she did her PhD research at the University of Nottingham. Uh, Advocates of Freedom uh, was published uh, only in September uh, by Cambridge University Press, and um, it really is a marvellous and very, very, very timely book. So I would urge those of you who can to um, recommend it to your librarians and uh, to your local librarians so that it gets a paperback uh, reissue because it really deserves as wide a readership as possible. Um, there are many contemporary resonances in the book, which I think will come out um, through uh, Hannah Rose's talk, but also through the Q&A at the end. Um, just some housekeeping before I hand over to our speaker this evening. Um, this event is obviously taking place in the Zoomiverse rather than the British Library, which means that um, whilst we aren't expecting any technical glitches, we obviously can't guarantee that these are not going to happen. So we would ask that you be patient should any gremlins occur on the line. Also, we very much encourage questions. Um, please, you can pop any questions that you may have for Hannah Rose in either the chat box or the Q&A box, and we're going to collate those and have about half an hour for discussion at the end of the talk, which is going to take place, uh, take place over the next 45 minutes or so. So without further ado, it is my real pleasure to hand over to Dr. Hannah Rose Murray. Thank you so much, Philip and, and Brett and Cara, the team at the Eccles Centre and the, the library as a whole for hosting this event. And I'm really privileged to, to be here. My research actually focuses quite a bit on Victorian newspapers. So the 19th century uh, newspaper collection at the British Library has been really instrumental to my work. And over the last few years, it, it's really been a, a joy visiting the, the library and uncovering so many fascinating stories about black activists, what happened during those lectures and uh, their impact on local communities. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So what I'm going to do today is actually share some stories from the book that Philip Carney mentioned. And uh, in, doing, in doing so, just sort of take you on a mini virtual tour of central London through sort of three locations where African-Americans uh, spoke and we'll flip between some maps and also a PowerPoint so you can actually see some of the folks who I'll be talking about. I usually issue a trigger warning at the start of my talks. Uh, I'm going to be talking about racism, slavery, racial violence and white domestic terrorism. So it's really important to sort of note that up front. And that's particularly relevant right now as we're obviously living through a pandemic which and, um, is disproportionately affecting people of colour around the world and, and also as we watch the Black Lives Matter protests still taking place around the world too. And the people that are, I'm going to be talking about today spent their lives protesting and campaigning for equality and in multiple ways declared that their Black Lives Mattered uh, way back in the 19th century. And there are so many parallels between then and now. One example is Ida B. Wells Barnett's anti-lynching campaign. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about her later. Um, and these connections are really pressing when we consider the modern lynchings of, of black women, men and, and trans folks in the US as well. And of course in Britain, we still see the legacies of slavery and racism um, in our own history of institutionalized racism, uh, police brutality against people of colour and even the commemoration of, of slave traders through monuments and obviously this year has sparked a lot of protests and, and tensions in places like Bristol. I'm sure you've seen the removal of Edward Colston's statue um, in Bristol, for example, that obviously took place a few months ago uh, in June. So in several ways, what I'm hoping to do in this talk is actually highlight not only the trajectory between activists in the 19th century and today, but actually how far we still have to go to accomplish their anti-racist missions. 
Okay, so here we go. I'm just going to share my um, screen with you and show you a uh, map from my website, which is uh, should be in the chat in a second. So my research recovers and amplifies African-American testimony from the British Isles during the 19th century with a particular focus on survivors of slavery from the southern states of the US. So for those uh, folks based in, in the UK who might not know a lot about um, slavery in the US, just a sort of a very, very brief overview. Slavery had existed in the, in the Americas since the 16th century and become firmly entrenched by the American Revolution in terms of um, in the northern and southern states. And in the Civil War fought between 1861 and 1865 led to the legal abolition of slavery in 1865. So the main period that I'm going to be talking about is the 1840s and the 1850s. And, and by that time, four million women, men and children were enslaved on um, uh, plantations, for example, from Louisiana to Mar Maryland, North Carolina. And it's important to note that from the very beginning, African-Americans resisted their oppression in, in numerous uh, ways from actually physically running away to Canada, to Britain. And I'll talk about that in a second, obviously. Um, also to the Northern states of the US where slavery didn't uh, exist um, uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. But they also formed maroon communities in the swamps of Florida and Louisiana on the actual plantation uh, itself. They broke tools, stole food, held secret meetings and uh, fought back against their enslavers or so-called slave breakers in, in various ways. Now, for those of him who uh, actually managed to escape, they formed the heart of the transatlantic anti-slavery movement. Women and men wrote about their experiences in slave narratives and autobiographies. They lectured on abolitionist platforms. They wrote poetry. They composed paintings or illustrations um, to teach uh, white Americans and also um, folks on this side of the Atlantic uh, about the realities of, of, of slavery. And some of these activists, these freedom fighters, made radical and politicised journeys across England, Ireland, Scotland, and even parts of rural Wales during the 19th century to inform the public about slavery. Now, just to kind of pause very quickly, um, and give a little bit of context in terms of Britain, because Britain had sort of legally abolished the slave trade in 1807 and slavery um, by the end of the 1830s sort of across the British Empire. And what's interesting is that instead of sort of confronting um, the nation's own problems with colonialism and, and racism, British and Irish audiences were really fascinated with stories about American slavery and as a result welcomed many black activists throughout the 19th century. Um, and they lectured in large cities to small fishing villages, speaking in uh, town halls and churches and chapels, the private parlor rooms of, uh, sort of wealthy patrons if they were lucky to have them, uh, school rooms and even open spaces. So what I try to do on my website, which is www.frederickdouglasinbritain.com, is essentially try and map as many of their speaking locations as I can. And currently the map that uh, hopefully you should be looking at there are about 4,700 uh, speeches on here, sort of represented by uh, about 26 African Americans. And obviously, this is a work in progress as I sort of daily discover more lectures. But right now, I've listed about 1,550 locations across Britain and Ireland where, where they lectured. And what's fascinating is that, you know, if you can explore the map, you can see that in the London area, there's just under 500, there's far more lectures happening outside of London. Um, and I can get into the reason why that might be the case in the Q&A if someone's interested or anyone's interested. Um, but as we kind of zoom into the map, the sort of the numbers dis dissipate and you can um, sort of zoom in a little bit further and, uh, and find, uh, for example, um, a man called Jay Hughes um, spoke um, in 1864. So there's a little bit of information if we know it about the venue, the date, um, things like that. And on the right hand side, there's a key for certain individuals if you want to explore. But as I'm sure you'll notice, just by immediately looking at the map, African Americans were speaking in, in cities, obviously, like London, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, but they were also sort of veering off traditional paths or what we would assume would be traditional parts of activism and heading all the way up to the Orkney Islands in Scotland. They were speaking in Lamberis at the foot of Snowdonia, in Keswick in the Lake District, Bakewell in the Peak District, Ventnor all the way down uh, the Isle of Wight, Colourcoats just off a sort of tiny fishing village just outside of Newcastle, um, and all the way down to Penzance and also John O'Groats as well. And in doing so, they traveled tens of thousands of miles. William Wells Brown estimates that he traveled about 25,000 miles uh, in the early 1850s when he was lecturing in, in Britain. And obviously, while this talk is going to mainly focus on, on London, as you can expect, numerous lecturers uh, spoke in churches and chapels, schoolhouses, music halls, 
taverns, uh, parks, literary institutions, private clubs, friends meeting houses, hotels, and uh, institutions like St. James's Hall, the Hall of Commerce as well, Freemasons Hall, and sometimes it's theatres too. Most African Americans were traveling in the 1840s, uh, sort of between the 1840s and the 1860s, until slavery was legally abolished in the US, as I've already mentioned in 1865. But it's important also to note that many African Americans were coming after 1865, because obviously the legacies of slavery still persisted through racism, segregation and lynching, which obviously, as I've mentioned already, we can still see um, with us today. But they were also speaking to all different types of audiences, working class, middle class, upper class, to the aristocracy, to newspaper editors, dock workers, uh, sailors, merchants, and some meetings were specifically organised for working class groups, and, and some meetings as well were specifically organised for children too, sometimes in Sunday schools, um, and sometimes in just purely open spaces. And British and Irish people came to listen to these speakers for a variety of reasons, for political reasons, because they may have been interested in the anti-slavery cause, but also there's an element of racial curiosity there to sort of hear witnesses of slavery speak uh, for themselves. Now, the other thing that you can explore on my website, um, if you'd like, is uh, I've done a couple of different types of mapping tools. Uh, I know uh, not necessarily IT literate, but this map is a really cool way of sort of examining the sort of concentration of lectures within a particular area. So as you can see, the sort of northern or um, area here, Manchester, Leeds, and again, Newcastle has a really high concentration um, of, of lectures in this uh, particular area. So I'm just gonna share um, my screen and hopefully get a PowerPoint up for you. So just to kind of talk a little bit more about why African-Americans were specifically coming to Britain and Ireland. So obviously they were coming to inform the transatlantic public about slavery. And you had folks like the Reverend Henry Highland Garnet um, who told stories about slavery's brutality. He was lecturing in 1851 and 1852. And in Belfast in 1851, he's talking to this particular audience and he says that the US nation was staggering under the putrid corpse of American slavery. Now, Garnet's speeches were very popular and this sort of idea and concept that African-Americans and, and survivors of slavery were coming over to inform the public about those brutalities um, sort of links into a, another reason why they were coming over here, which was to publish their written narratives called slave narratives, which became a central part of the transatlantic, uh, transatlantic even anti-slavery uh, movement. And particularly on this side of the Atlantic, the literary and commercial success of these narratives has sort of largely been forgotten, but in numerous cases, uh, particularly when we think about Frederick Douglass, Moses Roper and Josiah Henson, they're often outselling Victorian writers that we know today. So for example, Frederick Douglass sold 13,000 copies of his narrative in just under two years between 1845 and 1847. Moses Roper sold about 38,000 copies of his narrative um, up to about 1848. And Josiah Henson sold a quarter of a million copies of his revised slave narrative in 1876 in uh, just under two years, just a phenomenal figure. And when we compare it to someone like Lewis Carroll, who wrote um, Alice in Wonderland in 1865, in the first three years, um, that sold about 13,000 copies. And again, sort of fast forward a little bit to the end of the 1890s when Bram Stoker published Dracula, initial sales were only about 3000 uh, copies. So just the sheer number of these slave narratives that were sold uh, in, to the British and Irish public are really staggering. Other reasons why African-Americans were uh, coming here, they were encouraging people to sign petitions, sign anti-slavery petitions, to practice non-fellowship within slavers or slaveholding churches who were based in the US. They were writing letters to the press in the hope that newspaper coverage would be reflected back to the US. And in doing all of that, they were working with black British activists as well. They were also coming here to raise money to enact the legal purchase of themselves or, or family members, because technically, um, if someone escaped from slavery, they were still in the eyes of the law and um, still enslaved. And they also came over to, as part of that, to raise money for specific anti-slavery societies or causes. Another reason was that uh, certain African Americans actually came over to encourage boycotts of slave produced goods. So for example, in 1854, you have James Watkins saying that if this uh, particular audience could hear the groans of the slaves and witness for a moment their sufferings, you would never again touch Savannah rice. You would feel like you were eating the blood and bones of the Negroes. 
So that's a direct quote. So Watkins is essentially urging his audiences to be a bit more thoughtful and aware of the origins of the products that they regularly bought and consumed on a daily basis. This is at a time the, by the 1850s, 90% of the cotton that was coming into Liverpool was slave grown and was from the US. Now in their lectures, uh, Black Americans were doing a variety of things. They were exhibiting uh, instruments of torture, whips, chains. They were exhibiting paintings. They read their own poetry. They sang songs. They sometimes showed the scars on their bodies. They were lecturing, lecturing to quite literally millions of, of people, really pushing their bodies and, and voices to breaking point. And, and in doing so, in, in their lectures themselves, they were talking about the brutality of slavery, the, the rape and brutalization of Black women the separation of, of husband and wife, mother and child on, a child on the auction block, uh, the hypocrisy of American independence, the racism they experienced uh, in Britain and also uh, black heroic figures. Uh, and they talked about Madison Washington and Toussaint Louverture, for example. But the other thing as well is that black American uh, activists were <clears throat> really unafraid of pointing out British racism and its sort of colonialist um, uh, past and obviously uh, present at that point the nation's role in the slave trade, <clears throat> establishing slavery in the Americas and the West Indies, and also the development of racist thoughts. So in 1854, you have the Reverend Samuel Ringgold Ward, and he says to a York audience, and I'm quoting now, that since the Tudor times, British soil was reddened with the blood of my race. And he also pointed to the sort of lackluster response of the British government who completely ignored the numerous cases of Black British sailors who were docking in American ports like Charleston uh, and were kidnapped uh, and sold into uh, slavery. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to highlight the three areas or the three sites that uh, I'm going to be talking about. So if we were in, uh, in London and all, all together, um, it's sort of in a mini walking tour. The first place I'm going to talk about is Finsbury Chapel, which um, was located on East Street just here. Uh, and then we're going to head down to Bishopsgate and then uh, to um, the site of the Strand Palace Hotel, uh, which is the site of Exeter Hall. So this is uh, what Finsbury looked like. Uh, this is a map from um, the late, sort of the early 1890s and uh, Finsbury Chapel um, stood on East Street, which is just about here. And I will show you uh, a picture um, on my slides. This is what Finsbury Chapel would have looked like. And uh, it was one of the biggest chapels in, in London. It was founded in the mid sort of 1820s and was associated with Alexander uh, Fletcher, a Congregationist uh, minister. And it's a really great place to start as there were several African-Americans who spoke here. So the first person I want to sort of introduce you to is Moses Roper on the left here. And he spoke in, uh, at Finsbury Chapel in 1836. Now, Roper was born in 1815 in North Carolina. Torture and abuse at the hands of his enslavers after he tried to escape by his count between 16 and 20 times. Now he eventually managed to escape and came to Britain. He wrote a slave narrative which was published in 1837 in Britain and uh, it's actually regarded as one of the first containing illustrations of, of slavery including scenes of his own torture. Now within 10 years it sold 38,000 copies as I've already mentioned but it also sold 5,000 copies purely in the Welsh language as well. Now, across Britain and Ireland, Roper's sort of performances and lectures were often an unrelenting and brutal tale of slavery, focusing on uh, descriptions of torture he had personally experienced or, or witnessed. And he was really unafraid of challenging white fragility, and he refused to compromise over his barbaric accounts of, of lynching, which sometimes alienated or threatened the success of his um, message, because obviously he was predominantly speaking uh, to, to white audiences. And Roper's speech here at Finsbury Chapel marked the start of his lecturing career and was one of two in London that sparked immediate controversy. So after Roper gives this speech at Finsbury Chapel, uh, one minister objects to um, Roper's descriptions of, of slavery, and in particular to the lynchings of enslaved people that Roper was talking about in this particular meeting. And this minister essentially argued and wrote publicly that Roper was, was lying. And Roper refused to accept this slander, and in particular the accusation that he was sort of exaggerating the brutalities of slavery. And he wrote this public letter um, and recounted in excruciating detail the lynching of an enslaved man named uh, George, who was chained to a tree and was actually burned alive. And throughout his entire life, Roper refused to accept any slander or libel directed towards his very painful and traumatic uh, 
memories and he always defended himself and, and his sort of enslaved brethren so no, no matter what the cost and this began a, a lifelong career of public anti-slavery activism and was certainly not the only matter of controversy he experienced you know he was bold he was uncompromising as i've mentioned and just to give you another example he's lecturing um up in birmingham uh, to mainly sort of a methodist um audiences there are a lot of methodist ministers on the platform and he's talking about how pretty much every religious denomination including methodists owned enslaved people in the us and the Methodist ministers um, take objection to this and they try to get him on the platform to apologize and recount what he said. And Roper stands up and everyone obviously thinks he's gonna recount and apologize. And all he says is, my mother was enslaved by a Methodist. And this particular meeting ends in complete uproar. And, and similarly, in another meeting, uh, Roper was actually advised by a minister to sort of curtail his violent descriptions of, of slavery. Um, but Roper only says in reply, I shall tell the truth. So in lecture after lecture, Roper relays horrific stories of, of violence, of, of torture, infanticide, mass suicide and, and murder. And by doing so, there are White abolitionists tried to slander his reputation again and ruin the success of his lecturing tour. And his experience of violence was sort of so beyond their understanding, sort of in their thinking along this sort of white racist schema that they just assumed he was lying. So some newspaper correspondents, for example, just wrote about him with the most patrolic uh, and racist hatred that they accused him of essentially memorizing tortures that he had read about in books about the Spanish Inquisi Inquisition. But one of the most devastating slanders actually came from a former supporter of Roper's and a self-professed abolitionist called Thomas Price. Now, Price had originally written a testimonial in front of his, uh, in front of Roper's slave narrative. Um, and he sort of had provided aid and assistance uh, when Roper had decided to um, essentially train to become a missionary. Um, somewhere along the line, Roper essentially decided to change his career plans, as we are obviously all entitled to do. But Price was absolutely incensed with this, and he wanted um, his testimonial in Roper's narrative withdrawn because his um, essentially question of support was based on the fact that Roper wanted to become uh, a missionary. And he actually wrote a public letter saying that Roper was a beggar and a liar. He preyed on white philanthropy, all of this um, sort, of, sort of racist narrative. And this was hugely, hugely damaging to, to Roper's reputation and really restricted some of the places where he could uh, lecture as a result. And a few months after this letter was published, Roper actually wrote a public letter and wrote of his anxiety and depression that he now had mounting debts to pay because some avenues of support were essentially close to him. He was unable to sell copies of his, his narrative to earn a, a living. And he's full of anxiety. He is terrified that he's going to be um, dragged into um, prison and obviously there's a lot of personal trauma there because he was arrested and in prison so many times after trying to escape uh, slavery but he wrote this letter essentially to um, defend his own reputation to sort of prove the sheer extent of his, of his activism to reject all claims that he was a, a liar and and actually most importantly to make sure Price's letter was the direct cause of his uh, his misfortunes but the reason why I've sort of told the story is that it's really important because it reveals just because you were a sort of self-professed abolitionist, it didn't mean that you were anti-racist. And there are numerous examples of white abolitionists jeopardizing black abolitionists' missions, particularly in Britain and Ireland, uh, writing racist and patronizing descriptions of them and actually refusing to offer their support and sometimes uh, when these activists were in quite dire circumstances. So the second person who spoke at Finsbury Chapel is Frederick Douglass. He spoke here twice in 1846 and again in 1847. And I'm sure most of you have heard of Frederick Douglass. He's the most famous African-American of the 19th century. He was a radical activist for abolition, equality, social justice, feminism. Uh, and he led an unrelenting fight against slavery, uh, racism and white supremacy his entire life. He was an incredible orator, uh, author, poet, journalist, newspaper editor, just to name a few. And his escape from slavery in 1838, with the integral help of his wife, Anna Murray, would signal a sort of dramatic turning point in the anti-slavery movement. I just want to dwell very quickly on Anna Murray as well, because there would not be a Frederick Douglass without Anna Murray Douglas. And I urge you to um, check out the work of Professor Celeste Marie Bernier, who's working on some revolutionary um, research about Anna Murray Douglas at the moment. Um, but essentially, um, Douglas, after he escapes slavery, he travels around the eastern 
United States for a while lecturing and he publishes a slave narrative in early 1845 in the spring and he travels to Britain in the summer of 1845 and he stays here for nearly two years. Uh, he publishes a revised edition of his slave narrative, both Irish and English editions, and he works with abolitionists in London, Dublin, Edinburgh uh, and beyond, and he lectured over 300 times to audiences of all classes, um, genders, races and, and creeds. And his speech at Finsbury Chapel was really popular and he even published this, this speech as a, as a separate pamphlet. And I just want to read you some extracts, uh, some extracts uh, of this particular speech. So he started by sort of reiterating his mission to Britain, why he came to Britain in the first place. And I'm quoting now, he wanted the slaveholders of America to know that the curtain which conceals their crimes is being lifted abroad, that we are opening the dark cell and leading the people into the horrible recesses of what they are pleased to call their domestic institution. We want them to know that a knowledge of their whippings, their scourgings, their brandings, their chainings is not confined to the plantations, but that some negro of theirs has broken loose from his chains, has burst through the dark incrustation of slavery and is now exposing their deeds of deep damnation to the gaze of the Christian people of England. I expose slavery in this country because to expose it is to kill it. Slavery is one of those monsters of darkness to whom the light of truth is death. Expose slavery and it dies. Light is to slavery what the heat of the sun is to the root of a tree. It must die under it. To tear off the mask from this abominable system, to expose it to the light of heaven, aye, to the heat of the sun, that it may burn and wither it out of existence is my object in coming to Britain. I want the slaveholder surrounded as by a wall of anti-slavery fire so that, he, so that he may see the condemnation of himself and his system glaring down in letters of light. Now at this Finsbury Chapel meeting and in nearly every speech he gave, Douglas pointed to, in his words, this um, unholy alliance between slavery and religion in, in the South, in the Southern states. He attacked enslavers who said they were Christians or who were religious ministers, as the very brutalizing nature of slavery meant that religion and slavery were compatible. You know, he would argue, how could a, a Christian preach or go to church on a Sunday and then return to uh, their plantation and whip or rape uh, women and children? And he really tapped into debates in the British Isles that were going around at that time about whether British churches should renounce fellowship with their brethren in the US who supported slavery or who took a blind eye to its brutalities. And I think similar to some of the Black Lives Matter protests and some of the, the protests and placards we've seen, you know, he, Douglas was really getting into this sort of concept of silence was complicity. Silence was a type of, of violence in itself. And just to sort of extend this sort of analogy a little bit more, he actually argued at Finsbury, and I'm going to sort of ask for another quote, instead of preaching the gospel against this tyranny, rebuke and wrong of, of slavery, ministers of religion have sought by all and every means to throw in the background whatever in the Bible could be construed into opposition to slavery and to bring forward that which they could torture in its support. And he basically goes on to say that because he loved the purity of Christianity, uh, Douglas hated the slaveholding, the woman whipping, the mind darkening, the soul destroying religion that exists in the southern states of America. It is because I regard the one as good and pure and holy that I cannot but regard the other as bad, corrupt and wicked. Loving the one, I must hate the other. Holding to the one, I must reject the other. Now, using this really blistering testimony, testimony Douglas exposes the actions of the Free Church of Scotland. And he talks about this in, in Finsbury and other places in London, too. Now, <clears throat> the Free Church was formed in 1843 after Thomas Chalmers and his supporters broke away from the established Church of Scotland and to raise money for this new organization, uh, Chalmers essentially sends several Free Church missionaries, missionaries to the US um, to um, collect donations. They return with several thousand, thousand uh, pounds and abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic essentially find out that some of these donations came from enslavers. Now, when Douglas was traveling around Britain, he obviously discovered this, he was incensed and he used his position as a fugitive from slavery to blast what he called the free church for its actions. How could a church call itself free if it accepted this bloodstained money? And he settled on this slogan, send back the bloodstained money. And he spoke to thousands of Scottish people in towns like Edinburgh, Glasgow, Perth, uh, Aberdeen. Songs and poems were written about his campaign, send back the money where the slogan was painted in red paint on free church buildings at the pavements of Edinburgh and the streets of Edinburgh, uh, free church buildings themselves. And um, along with two white Quaker women, Douglas actually climbs Arthur's seat, uh, which is a small mountain in Edinburgh, if you know Edinburgh, and carved send back the money into the hillside. 
And no other white abolitionist could describe the realities of slavery like Douglas. And he accused the free church ministers of accepting this blood stained money that ought to have gone to his education, which was obviously denied to him under slavery. And he even created a sort of fictional scenario for his audiences where he imagined himself as being sold by his enslaver with the profits going into the free church treasury. Now, unfortunately, the money was actually never returned, but as Douglas later said, um, he gave him the opportunity to sort of make uh, British and uh, Scottish audiences in particular aware of um, the reach of American slavery. And I just want to also um, briefly highlight two other men who spoke at Finsbury uh, Chapel. So William Henry Jackson spoke here in December 1862, and also John Sella Martin, who you should see on the right hand side here, he lectured here in May 1863, both of whom urging, uh, urged their audiences to support the Union cause as this was during the American Civil War. And I'm sure most of you are aware the American Civil War fought between the Union, sort of largely the Northern States, um, and the southern states where slavery existed, the Confederacy, uh, it was fought between 1861 and 1865, and it had huge consequences for the British Isles. It's a really brilliant book by Richard Blackett, um, if you want to learn more about this history. And Britain actually became uh, perilously close to recognising the Confederacy, in, in part for two reasons. There were some aristocrats and, and sort of influential politicians who admired the South's calls for sort of a, establishing a new republic. Um, but mainly it was sort of economic. Britain relied, as I've mentioned, so much on the importation of cotton, sugar, tobacco, um, it would be a real problem for the economy of, of Britain. And with the onset of war, there was a blockade. So the, the imports of cotton in particular dried up. This meant that thousands of British working men and women, um, particularly in Lancashire and Cheshire and Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, actually became unemployed. They languished in poverty because of the war. But African-Americans like John Sella Martin urged their audiences not to support the Confederacy as it was um, synonymous with, with slavery and white supremacy. So uh, between 1862 and 1863, uh, William uh, Henry Jackson uh, toured uh, Britain and lectured about his escape from his enslaver who happened to be Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy. And he sort of even publicly humiliated a Confederate official in London shortly after he gives this Finsbury Chapel speech. Um, he goes up to him one uh, evening after a lecture, introduces himself as a former coachman of Davis and sort of walks outside with this official. And the official is met with a small group of abolitionists who are holding all these anti-slavery images um, of, of slavery's brutality there. Um, and Jackson caused quite a lot of laughter at these meetings because um, he retells the story that uh, Davis had apparently written to him saying that um, demanding that he return back to his enslavement by a particular date and, and Jackson said well I, I thought I would be polite and write back and say that I'm in London at that date so I can't make it. As you can imagine that caused quite a lot of laughter in the audience. But John Seller Martin too also spoke out against the Confederacy and, and um, actually served uh, as a minister in London for a short period of time while he was here as well. And he declared here at Finsbury and in other places that he hoped Confederate sympathisers in, in Britain I'll just read you this quote, had not yet been so successful as to blow sugar into their eyes or cotton into their ears and thus prevent them from seeing the horrors of slavery and hearing the groans of the poor oppressed slave. So Martin is obviously um, using the cotton and the sugar there, in, in, you know, to thinking about boycotting slave produced goods. But Martin also basically was saying that um, he hoped the British public weren't actually foolish enough to be deceived by such pro-Confederate uh, propaganda. And he argued that the war was simply between freedom and slavery. It was a question of civilization and humanity, he said. But much to the relief of these African-Americans, Britain actually didn't sort of formally recognize the Confederacy, but their lectures went a long way about the real reasons for the cause of the war. So we're going to move to our second location. So showing you these brilliant maps, uh, we're going to go to Crosby Hall, which is here. This is in Bishopsgate. And uh, the original sort of sites uh, here, there's been a, um, a hall was built sort of since the mid 1400s. But actually um, now Crosby Hall has essentially moved to Chelsea in 1910. The whole building was moved, uh, was moved there. So I'll just show you a couple of um, pictures of uh, what it would have looked like. This is here on the left and an interior when it was turned into a fancy looking restaurant uh, in the 1880s. So this is Crosby Hall. And I just want to sort of tell you the story of Josiah Henson who spoke uh, in Crosby Hall in 1851. He was born enslaved in, in Maryland uh, in 1789. And Henson was a, a, an orator, community activist, author, preacher, soldier. He was the only person of color to exhibit at the great exhibition in London uh, in 1851. 
But Henson is sort of most famously known for his association with the character of Uncle Tom in Harriet Beecher Stowe's sort of famous anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And this was a sort of transatlantic phenomenon in this novel. It sold a million copies of Britain, uh, sorry, a million copies in Britain, I should say, alone, um, just, just after a year, I should say. And Henson was really fascinating because he essentially encouraged this association that Stowe had based the character of Tom on his uh, life story. And uh, Henson revised the slave narrative and used base to actually describe the realities of slavery because Stowe as a white American woman had no idea about the realities of slavery, whereas Henson as a formerly enslaved person obviously could, um, could talk about those details. The really interesting thing about, thing about Henson is that two decades after Un uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin is, is published, uh, Henson actually travels once again to Britain in 1876. And he needed money to essentially settle his mortgage. Most of the, his work and finances had been tied up to helping other fugitives escape um, to Canada, where he now lived. And when he reached London, he worked with a reformer and journalist called John Lobb, uh, who was based in London. And Lobb was essentially fascinated with Henson's story, and he marketed Henson as the Uncle Tom. And this was a really huge success because even 20 years after the novel was published, Uncle Tom's Cabin was just a, just still um, a phenomenal success. There were sort of Uncle Tom's Cabin productions um, and dramas going on all, all the way through London and, and throughout the country. And Henson's sort of lecturing tour was a, a real success. In six months, he spoke to half a million people, which is impressive as a whole, but more impressive when you learn he was 88 at this point. He was invited to meet Queen Victoria in March 1877 at Winter Palace. You can see a picture here on the right. And he even had a model of himself constructed in Man and Two Swords. And as I've already mentioned, um, his slave narrative or revised edition of that narrative um, sold a phenomenal quarter of a million uh, copies. But this relationship with this sort of fictional character of Uncle Tom was incredibly uh, complex and even actually became quite tiresome. So this association brought him fame, but he, when we look at some of his speeches, he also outrightly rejected it. So he gives a speech in Dundee in March 1877. He's introduced as the Uncle Tom. He stands on stage and the first thing he says is, my name is not Tom. My name is not Uncle Tom. I do not want any other name printed in the newspapers other than my own. My name is Josiah Henson. And unfortunately for him, the coverage the next day of this particular speech was Uncle Tom in Dundee. But it really gets to the heart of this sort of difficult association and relationship that Henson has with this fictional character, particularly by the 1870s. I've already mentioned that there are a lot of dramas and productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin going on. A lot of these productions are grounded in racist um, minstrel stereotypes. So the character of, of Tom, you know, the sort of exaggerated and grotesque um, uh, characteristics or sort of the and the racialized features um, were on display in these in these productions and you know perhaps Henson didn't necessarily want to be associated with um, Uncle Tom all the time or he was getting tired of it. So there was a, another African-American who spoke at Crosby Hall as well and his name was William Craft. He spoke there in 1855 but he also spoke in uh, another location which I'll just take you to now which will be the final location. Um, so we have here Exeter Hall. So obviously you've got the Lyceum Theatre here and Somerset House, and this is the Strand for those of you who know London. And Exeter Hall was a very famous uh, venue um, in sort of 19th century uh, society. It was uh, first opened in 1831, unfortunately uh, destroyed in 1907. And as you can see, it covers quite a space. There was a, um, one auditorium could hold up to sort of four and a half thousand people. And I just show you a really beautiful uh, illustration of what a meeting would have looked like potentially in Exeter Hall. So on the left, this is an illustration of an anti corn law uh, meeting that was held in 1846, which is actually the same year that Frederick Douglass spoke at Exeter Hall. And on the right hand side, you have uh, an image here um, of, um, of the exterior. So because of its fame as an anti-slavery uh, meeting venue, there are several black Americans who spoke here. So Nathaniel Paul as early as 1833, Charles Lennox uh, Raymond in 1840, uh, I've mentioned Douglas in 1846, uh, Reverend Henry Highland Garnet in 1851, uh, William Wells Brown and um, Samuel Ringgold Ward both in 1853, uh, and John Anderson in 1861. So quite a few people. But I just want to tell the story of William and Ellen Crafts because William spoke here in the early 1850s. 
Now, both were enslaved in, in Georgia. Uh, they, their escape attempts um, is documented in their slave, slave narrative called Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. It was published in London in 1860. I urge you all to read it. And it's also, um, you can read it online for free, documenting the American uh, South, which is a really great website that houses all of these slave narratives. Essentially, both William and Ellen resolved to escape over um, sort of the Christmas period of 1848. And Ellen's complexion at the time was um, described as um, quite fair. And that was a result of her mother's rape by her enslaver. But, she, but that meant that she could cross the boundaries of race, of gender, of class, and even physical ability to dress as a Southern white man. Uh, and William would pose as her enslaved uh, servant, essentially, and they would both escape slavery. This image here on the left is Ellen dressed in sort of uh, gentleman's clothing. It's actually flipped. So this, this white mark you see here or line is actually a bandage covering her right arm. Because um, literacy and learning to read and write was uh, punishable by death, um, for the enslaved population, obviously, uh, Ellen uh, could not read or write, so she essentially posed as, as a disabled white man so that she wouldn't have to sign her name when they were catching a train or a steamboat. And obviously, it's, uh, well, it's an obvious point that this is a really huge risk. It was a massive testament to Ellen's bravery in particular that they managed to pull this escape attempt off. Everything rested on her performance as a white Southern man traveling outside of the county, the state into unknown territory that obviously she'd never been to before. And if they failed, they would have been subjected to uh, torture, abuse, and would have been forcibly separated uh, and sold to another plantation. And as it's documented in their narrative, um, and as was the custom, the Jim Crow custom, obviously white people were um, in a different carriage than um, people of African descent. So Ellen was in this carriage completely by herself uh, at one point, she recognizes a white man coming into the carriage as a friend of her um, former enslaver. So she's absolutely terrified that she's going to get recognized. But they managed to make it to Boston. Essentially, there are some um, slave catchers who are lying in wait to try and drag them back down into slavery. So they flee to Britain and they remain here for nearly 20 years. They raise five children in freedom here. They travel around the, the country to denounce uh, slavery and later the Confederate cause during um, the American Civil War. And Ellen in particular turned her home into a hub of black activism. She invited fellow lecturers to stay there. She supported numerous reform causes like temperance and suffrage, as well as anti-slavery, of course. She went to private parties and challenged racist thinkers. And when she heard rumors um, that were going around the US press, saying that she wanted to go back into slavery, she wrote a public letter that was printed on both sides of the Atlantic, where she said boldly, I would rather starve a free woman than be a slave for the best man that ever breathed upon the American continent. So Ellen's story sort of causes us to reflect on uh, the other black women of the transatlantic anti-slavery uh, movement. Some of, most of the people I discuss in, uh, in the book as well are actually in men. And that's because of Victorian racial and gender dynamics, it was far more difficult for um, women, let alone black women to speak on a public stage when their sort of role um, was supposed to be in a private domestic sphere rather than speaking to audiences on political matters, but they were integral to the movement. So Sarah Parker Remond here in the middle, she had great success at lecturing in England and Scotland in the late 1850s and early 1860s. She revived anti-slavery societies. She spoke alongside Frederick Douglass uh, twice and when he returned to Britain in 1859. And uh, she actually um, lived out the rest of her days in Italy. She trained as a nurse and lived there. She did not return to the US. We also have uh, folks that, um, like Jane Brown, here you can see her with her activist husband, Benjamin William Brown and her children. Because I think the other thing as well, when we talk about black women in the anti-slavery movement is that it's often a question of um, erasure and invisibilization where we aren't able to necessarily understand or know a lot about their movements or about their testimony. And Jane Brown is an example of that. We don't know whether she gave lectures in her own right alongside her husband. It's really difficult to try and um, sort of discern that. And another example is Julia Jackson. She was the activist wife of John Andrew Jackson, you know, who they both traveled around the British Isles. And she actually gave lectures in her own rights, but the newspaper correspondents who were obviously, you know, more often than not white men, um, gave extensive, extensive coverage to her husband's lectures, but would say things like, Mrs. Jackson stood up and gave a short speech. And that's all we know. Um, so it's sort of difficult trying to extract her voice as well.
But the last person I want to um, talk to you about today is Ida B. Wells Barnett, because she also spoke at Exeter Hall in 1894. And she's being discussed a lot in the press right now, not only because of the continuities between the um, lynching of the 19th century and 20th century that she fought so ferociously against, and obviously the lynching we still see today. Um, but in May 2020, uh, so this year, she was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for her journalism, so better, better late than never. But uh, Wells Barnett was a leading activist against lynching. Um, she was also one of the co-founding members of the NAACP, one of America's oldest civil rights organizations. Now, historians estimate that between the 1880s and the 1960s, more than 4,400 African-Americans were lynched, so murdered without trial across the US, although, of course, the real figure is likely to be a lot higher than that. And these lynchings were public acts of torture where um, black women, men and children were burned. They were stabbed with hot pokers. They were shot, mutilated and hanged. Photographs of their bodies were taken and occasionally white, school, uh, white children were given the day off school to watch. Wells Barnett's campaign against lynching um, began after a friend of hers um, was lynched in Memphis and she was outraged. She penned an editorial in her uh, newspaper um, sort of denouncing the sort of white supremacist mob. And she was actually chased out of Memphis on, on pain of death um, because she'd written this piece, but she vowed to record as much information about lynching as possible and publish it. And as she sort of famously said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Wells Barnett visited Britain in 1893 and 1894 to raise support for the anti-lynching campaign and in 1894 in particular she has a really successful tour. She works with newspaper editors, aristocrats, merchants, uh, religious ministers, reformers and even black students from the University uh, of London to uh, hold numerous meetings uh, against lynching. Um, she collects all of the articles that were written about her um, talks and she essentially sends them to the governors of um, southern states, even to the presidents. Um, a lot of these um, governors were actually disgusted that in sort of their words, uh, an African-American woman was spreading lies about um, the US uh, to, to Britain. And they would often, often print, obviously, very racist descriptions of her. Um, and what she would do is that in these meetings in Britain, she would read out these articles, sort of expose their racism. And she would say, out of their own mouths will the murderers be condemned. So in these speeches, actually controversially, controversially for the time, Wells Barnett attacked sort of the Southern justification for lynching, which centered on sort of black criminality um, and the rape of innocent white women um, by aggressive black men. And instead, Wells argued that lynching was solely used to suppress the black population. And, and often white women actually voluntarily entered into relationships with black men. When they were caught by their local community, they cried rape, which led to the lynching of black men. In 1894, Wells Barnett, spoke over 35 times in London and her activism led to sort of the establishment of an anti-lynching committee, which was supported by influential aristocrats, newspaper editors, um, MPs. And throughout her tours, she was unafraid of challenging white supremacy. She exposed the actions of white feminists as well, who tried to ruin the success of her mission. I can go into that a little bit in the Q&A if people are interested. And she also uh, attacked British racism too. She wrote an article entitled Liverpool Slave Traditions and Present Practices. And she actually criticizes um, the city's role in the slave trade, the legacy of slavery. And, and she really uh, targets Britain's sort of deliberately constructed historical amnesia around uh, slavery and sort of reminded audiences that merchants and even ordinary citizens in Liverpool and beyond um, relied on slave growing cotton and these cities were built on the profits of the slave trade. Now, as I sort of draw uh, my talks to a close, I, I hope my talk has highlighted how for those of us who, who live in Britain and Ireland, we you know, are walking past sites that are rich in, in black activism on a daily basis and not just in London too. And we can't forget their, their actions, their testimony, or the knowledge that in organizing these really exhausting lecturing tours, they were recounting their, their trauma night after night for sometimes hours uh, on end, you know, reliving brutal memories of, of torture in order to educate um, largely white audiences about the realities of slavery and its legacies. So what once were uh, taverns, churches, uh, town halls may now be sort of hotels, car parks or offices, but they remain uh, monuments to the inspiring heroism and relentless activism of these freedom fighters. Particularly right now, I think we should all share in their hope too, that we will one day live uh, in a more equal and just world. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
Wow, thank you so much for that, Hannah Rose. Um, if we were in a theatre, um, we would all obviously be um, doing this, um, but I think <laughs> on behalf of the over 200 people who have tuned in at points during um, that talk, I think I, I, I clap on behalf of everyone. Um, so we have about 25 minutes um, for questions, and we've had at dozens of questions come in over the course of your talk. So I apologize in advance for people who've taken the time to, um, to, field, to post questions in the chat or the Q&A. There's no way we're gonna get through all of them, but um, I'm gonna, going to try to bunch as many together as possible so we can, um, so we can answer people's uh, enthusiasm and interest in your topic um, as much as we can. Um, I'm going to start um, with uh, a question which picks up on the contemporary resonances that you were speaking about um, at the end. And this is a very, very fascinating, very important, and I think quite a complex question to start you off with. And it's um, from Joseph Levermore, who um, I think was, is picking up on what you said about how abolitionists were not necessarily anti-racists. And he asks, what were the philosophical um, or kind of intellectual grounds for being an abolitionist and yet racist? And is there anything that we can learn from such a pathology to combat current racism? Yeah, that's a brilliant question to start with. Um, I think the, what I will say to start with is that the abolitionist movement was really fractured and was really divided. There were a lot of tensions between some abolitionists who um, their philosophy was very much one of gradual abolition. So um, they believed that slavery should be abolished in maybe five, um, eight years time. So there was a kind of plan to prepare and put that in action. Whereas you had other abolitionists. So you have um, someone like William Lloyd Garrison, who was a white abolitionist based in Massachusetts. He was sort of seen as very radical at the time because he believed in immediate abolition. So slavery had to end now, today, this very minute, because obviously of all the brutalities that were going on. So that's just sort of a very, um, general overview of some some of the kind of um, strands of abolition. Um, I think because um, we're talking about two societies, and obviously I'm, I'm talking about Britain and in the US specifically, we're talking about two societies that are essentially built on um, slavery and, and racism and white supremacy. So it's perhaps surprising that obviously abolitionists and white abolitionists too should um, exhibit sort of racist and somewhat patronizing um, uh, attitudes towards black Americans. So just to give you a couple of examples, when Frederick Douglass um, travels around Britain between 1845 and 1847, he has to deal with essentially what I suppose we would call today is sort of microaggressions um, of, um, of people sort of um, being difficult towards him. Um, he, um, you know, from kind of what we might see as sort of slightly minor things um, to, um, uh, other situations where you have um, the Irish abolitionist Richard D. Webb, who describes Douglas um, in a letter as, as a savage and a wild animal. Um, you know, so that kind of um, horrific racialized imagery there. Um, and also um, other elements where sort of there were um, white abolitionists sometimes thought that black abolitionists couldn't control uh, money in terms of like the funding pot, so anything that Douglas raised, it couldn't necessarily go through him, um, and that it wasn't necessarily a respectable career to be a lecturer. Um, and just to again tell the story of, of um, with Frederick Douglas, there was another uh, white uh, abolitionist called Maria, Maria Weston Chapman who was um, friends with William Lloyd Garrison. She essentially writes a series of letters to Richard D. Webb, this person I mentioned earlier, and says that um, she's actually really worried that Douglas is going to desert the abolitionist cause and go to a different abolitionist society that they were sort of hostile with um, because Douglas had chosen to speak at this other abolitionist society. Um, and they exchanged a huge back and forth because when Douglas found out about this, he said, I am literally going to speak at any anti-slavery meeting I'm invited or anything, I, you know, or anywhere I would like to go to because you do not control me. Um, and just to sort of bring it back to the question as well, um, I think the end of that question was sort of what can we learn from, from today? And I think actually there's a lot that um, particularly um, our white allies um, can learn about um, the actions of white abolitionists in the past, this kind of um, uh, white abolitionists in the 19th century were very much trying to control black abolitionist speakers in some way. So they essentially um, wanted a black abolitionist to speak, to sort of stand up, speak, 
talk about the brutalities of slavery and sit back down again. Um, and famously, um, someone said to uh, someone said this to Frederick Douglass, and he basically replied and said, you know, I didn't feel just like um, talking about those wrongs. I felt like denouncing them. He wanted to create his own philosophy. And I think that that's something that we can learn from today is where allies give people of color the space to talk about their own testimony, their own experiences of racism, to listen, to be quiet, um, and to actually provide that space um, and, uh, and be um, allies with hearts and minds open. Thank you. Yes, I was particularly um, struck by what you said about um, the preparedness of African American abolitionists to kind of turn the mirror back on um, Britain's own histories of um, enslavement and racism, and that it wasn't necessarily a kind of comfortable um, uh, discourse about the horrors that were happening over there. And I'm sure that didn't play particularly well with a lot of audiences. Um, we've got a couple of questions about um, the mobility of the African American activists that you've um, spoken about. I think, you know, one of the things that strikes people who are new to this subject is the very fact of this mobility, uh, both kind of making it all the way across the Atlantic, but within the United Kingdom, but also kind of further afield. So I'm just going to throw two questions at you on this theme. Um, mm -hmm. First is from Lyndall Port, who asks, um, how did the escaped African-American slaves get to Britain in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and second, Amanda Delisle wants to know, did they go elsewhere in Europe on these speaking tours once they were here? Yeah, two brilliant questions. Thank you for that. Um, so depending on um, the networks of support that African-Americans had, so um, for, for those obviously based in the US and actually getting over to Britain, sometimes they had their passage paid by sort of friendly white abolitionists who were based in the US. So I mentioned William and Alan Craft, um, obviously their um, escape to Britain was um, pretty immediate because obviously slave catchers were quite literally coming to Boston um, to try and drag them back down to slavery. Um, so abolitionists raised that money and also in the case of Frederick Douglass um, and Moses Roper too um, there were sort of essentially friendly um, folks who could help them out sometimes with others um, if they sort of announced that they were going to do a tour um, if they were lecturing sort of early in, sort of on, on the eastern coast of the US um, they would collect donations from the end of meetings to sort of to, to meet that cost of the of the steamship um, and sometimes um, when you had someone like Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, who was traveling, sometimes some of her travel was actually sponsored and paid for societies on this side of the Atlantic, um, on the Atlantic as well. Um, and sorry, I've forgotten the second question. What was it? Sorry, Philip. Uh, um, how, uh, whether the um, activists uh, traveled elsewhere in Europe. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so sometimes they did. So uh, on my map, uh, it looks a little bit odd because there's only three, three, three uh, locations, but James Watkins actually went to Paris and Dieppe, and I can't remember the third place, which I've mapped on there. Um, and uh, sometimes um, they traveled to uh, Italy and, and France France as well, not necessarily to sort of sustain lecturing tours, because the thing about coming to Britain and Ireland is that there's a shared language there and also um, in a way a shared culture. So there was a kind of element of, of ease of talking to British and Irish audiences. Um, but France is an interesting one. I just mentioned James Watkins, but William Wells Brown uh, travels to uh, Paris a couple of times. The first time is in 1849. He attends the Peace Congress that's held there. He goes with several abolitionists. He meets Victor Hugo um, and sort of other um, sort of French uh, people of note. Um, and he tells this really great story in, in his sort of travel narrative, which I urge everyone to read. That's available on Documenting the American South. Um, and he talks about how he notices some pro-slavery Americans who are at this Peace Congress uh, who traveled over with him in the, the steamship and they were incredibly racist towards him um, and obviously didn't give him the time of day. And then when William Wells Brown is being introduced to all of these sort of high figures of note and to people like Victor Hugo, um, all of these sort of pro-slavery Americans kind of come up to Brown and side luck to him and say, oh, can you introduce me to this person, this person, because obviously you're now the most respectful person in the room. Um, so uh, yes, they did travel um, to other parts of Europe, but not necessarily with sustained tours, if that answers your question. Great, thank you. Um, we've had quite a few questions um, come in that are asking, uh, asking you to elaborate or speculate on the really difficult question of reception and audience response and the extent to which one can reconstruct that and mm. whether one can really know 
uh, whether the speeches or, or, or um, various kind of intervention, activist interventions that were being made were received enthusiastically or not. So um, again, I'm going to try to um, bunch a, a couple of these together. So um, Charles Jones asks, was there competition between uh, British families to host these American visitors? So was there a kind of real uh, enthusiasm on the ground to, um, uh, to receive these visitors? Um, Rachel Hill asks, um, were the audiences for the talks exclusively white? Um, then there are two questions which I think are kind of insinuating a, a question about how effective these were in terms of actually mobilizing anti-racist um, feeling. One of which is from uh, Khadija Rashid, who asks, were any of these places that the anti-racist talks, were they ever attacked um, or the subject of um, physical or verbal um, vilification? And um, Isabel Wilson has asked, um, how far have you found the act activists were received merely as spectacle in the UK and Ireland? Mm. So quite a lot for you to be getting on with that. <laughs> um, sorry, I just want to reiterate, we are having dozens and dozens of questions come in. I'm, I'm, it's, it's fantastic. And I'm sure um, we, we will um, relay all of these to um, Hannah Rose to look at um, offline as well. Um, yeah, please do. If your question doesn't get answered, then feel free to contact me directly. I'm more than happy to, to chat to folks. Um, yeah, thank you for all of the questions that people have sent in and particularly all of those ones that you've just read out, Philip. So um, I think the first thing about reception and audience, audience response is that it's very difficult to try and um, piece uh, some of these responses together because a lot of the sources that I'm looking at are essentially um, sort of newspaper coverage uh, of these particular meetings. Sometimes if uh, it wasn't mentioned or alluded to, then we might not know about um, whether this particular meeting was successful or not. Just to tell a couple of stories to sort of speak to hopefully all of those questions. Um, Frederick Douglass uh, is an easy one to start with because he was an absolute sensation in Britain Island. And there's some really wonderful uh, anecdotes um, from the British press because British um, and Irish newspaper correspondents just waxed lyrical about his amazing oratory and his charisma and things like that and his amazing performances. He, he speaks in Colchester in March 1847 and there's a really beautiful sort of anecdote of you know hundreds of people are sort of cramming the aisles of this particular church to hear him speak. Um, hundreds of people are quite literally turned away um, and sort of for a few enterprising um, folk they actually go around the side of the church and sort of crane their necks to listen through an open window sort of such as a desire to hear him um, to hear him speak. So you obviously have um, instances where um, someone like Douglas is, is very much sort of in, in demand. Um, you have um, other meetings that sort of did end in, in uproar. I mentioned earlier about Moses Roper. Um, some of Douglas's meetings did um, uh, go the wrong way, should we say, um, because there were several people in the audience who objected to what he was saying about religion. Obviously, I touched on that in my talk, and uh, Douglas was a deeply religious man, but sometimes um, audiences were, I think, quite offended by what he was saying about Christianity in the South and they weren't necessarily able to distinguish and understand what Douglas was saying between the different types of Christianity. So sometimes that led to a lot of, um, you know, sort of uproarious behaviour. I and mean, we have to think that these talks and a bit like the theatre, you know, there are comparisons to the theatre, you know, if um, a, a speaker was um, doing very well, they'd be stamping their feet, clapping, cheering, people standing up. And obviously if the meeting wasn't going to go so well, then there would be people shouting at the podium, confusion, manic confusion, things like that. And just to tell a sort of third story in the base of that, there were other figures who um, are not necessarily well known. A man called William Watson gave a lecture against the Confederacy during the Civil War up, um, I think it's sort of around, it's definitely in the Midlands, I can't quite remember where, but basically um, he walks into this uh, meeting and there are several pro-Confederate um, sort of working class um, guys there and they essentially stand in front of him as he's trying to give his talk and they shout repeatedly and interrupt him throughout his talk three cheers for president jefferson davis you know three cheers for the confederacy and they attempt to essentially um they push him you know they it doesn't necessarily result in an argument or in a massive fight um but there is a lot of um um kind of backlash um backlash there i think the other thing i'd say as well is that it's really difficult to talk about impact because I found some really lovely anecdotes as well in, in the sources in the British press of, of how people are affected by these, um, by these speakers. So 
Henry Highland Garner is giving a lecture and he's obviously talking about the brutalities of slavery and um, this person actually stands up after the end of his tour, uh, his talk and he says I'm a sailor I have smoked tobacco for 40 years and um, I've never sort of understood how tobacco is linked to the slavery and to, to slave, sorry, to slavery in the South. I will never ever touch tobacco again. And obviously there's no way to prove whether he did or not, but I think the fact that he's obviously making this public declaration, um, you know, is, is really, really significant. You know, you have, uh, particularly after Frederick Douglass and William Wells Brown's seeking tours, you have people sort of donating to um, what were anti-slavery bazaars that were sort of held in the US, which were essentially big fairs that people would come and buy lots of goods and the money would go to the anti-slavery movement. Um, and whenever a speaker came around, the donations to these bazaars obviously increased because people were sort of really touched and influenced by not only a speaker's, um, or sort of the speaker's lecture, but also reading the narrative as well of, 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 these, of these particular um, stories. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question about sort of trying to mobilize anti-slavery feeling and, and you know because that's a really great um, question too and I mentioned about Sarah Parker Remond who was trying to well she actually revived anti-slavery societies that were kind of dwindling or had become extinct and her lecturing tour had a direct impact on those societies. Frederick Douglass creates a new anti-slavery society it doesn't last long but obviously when he's here it's very successful and Ida B. Wells Barnett creates an anti-lynching committee too. Um, just to also touch briefly on this idea of spectacle, I think that definitely comes into it. We can't escape the fact that adverts for some of these lecturers were placed next to adverts of minstrel shows um, and also sort of other racialized um, uh, dramas. And Frederick Douglass commented on that endlessly too um, in his speeches. Um, there was an element of, um, of spectacle for sure, and there will be. Um, there were sort of several newspaper correspondents who are um, pretty clear in their racism. You know, they say, oh, I went to this lecture expecting, you know, some kind of um, uh, something that I'd seen in a minstrel show. Um, and actually I was blown away by the eloquence of this particular lecturer. And again, just to kind of touch on that because the sort of um, terms of eloquence and sort of um, surprise um, at how um, articulate um, these survivors were is obviously grounded in racial stereotypes as well and, and actually we're still seeing that today you look at some of the conversation around Marcus Rashford and his brilliant campaigning and there's also sort of comments about his eloquence and his you know he's very articulate and that's completely grounded back in 18th, 19th, 18th and 19th century sort of descriptions. Um, lastly um, there was a question about sort of competition between families and networks um, that's a really great question because I think with some of these activists there were uh, networks were really important to the success of the, these these tours. So again, Frederick Douglass, when he comes in 1845, you know, he has this whole network of abolitionists that he can stay with. He stays with the Webb family in Dublin, the Jennings family in Cork, the Esteban family in Bristol, the, you know, with William Smeal in, in Glasgow. Um, and usually these abolitionists I've just mentioned, because they were aligned within the same abolitionist group, so with William Lloyd Garrison, they tended to work together. And John Eslin, who was in Bristol, he was really um, uh, good at sort of organizing um, and re recommending what Douglas should do in Bristol um, to a certain extent. So he basically said to Douglas, right, you can come and stay with me for a week. And I know uh, this person, this person, this person, I know this newspaper correspondent, so he can write a favorable coverage of your speech. I'm going to print because I've got the money, 3000 handbills to distribute um, and get people to come to your lecture but I don't know this particular circle of people. So you should go and stay with my Quaker friend because he's gonna introduce you to a different circle. And then those folks are gonna introduce you to different circles. So it was all about sort of maximizing um, sort of interest in the anti-slavery cause. But the last thing I will mention just on that point is that um, there was competition um, in, in the sense that because some abolitionists didn't always agree with each other, um, there was a lot of petty squabbling, if I'm being frank. So the Esselin family again um, in Bristol, when Henry Highland Garnet, Josiah Henson and Samuel Ringgold Ward are doing talks um, and tours in the early 1850s, they write really uh, sort of in letters sort of between each other. They're saying like, there's this direct quote, you know, we're in a perpetual state of warfare against the Richardson family in Newcastle because all of, you know, Garnet and, and Ward and, and Henson are being supported by other abolitionists, the Richardson family included. And one of the Essen family is so convinced that someone from the Richardson 
group or family has actually come to spy in on their anti-slavery meetings and you know they're just obsessed with sort of trying to ruin each other's reputation and obviously you know for a lot of these black americans the overall goal was we need to focus on american slavery and that's kind of part of i think uh, going back to the first question about these um the the tensions and also the sometimes how ridiculous allies um or supposed allies it could be um so I think I will stop there because I think I've tried to answer everything um, that you've covered. But, yeah. um, and I think that, that we're going to have to um, uh, stop there for the um, evening, I'm afraid. I mean, we could go on all night. Um, we've had over 50 comments and questions and it has been, um, the response has been absolutely um, terrific. I think you've really, really captured a theme which obviously has very, very strong resonances about uh, Britain's own uh, thinking through its experiences of race and racism, connecting very powerfully with what's going on in the USA. And that obviously speaks to our current moment, which I think accounts for the, um, the real engagement that we've had here. We'll have to get you back into the library at some point when this is all over. Um, but just to, um, uh, just to reaffirm, um, we, uh, Ask your librarian to buy it. It is quite expensive in hardback, uh, but ask your librarian to buy it. You can also consult it at the British Library um, once. Uh, uh, in fact, no, we are reopening our reading rooms as of Tuesday. So if you have a reader's ticket and are um, able to book a reader's um, desk, uh, you can come and visit us there. Um, uh, but for now, I would uh, urge you all to, um, uh, from the comfort of your own homes, uh, give another round of applause to um, Anna Rose Murray. And I would also like to thank you all very, very, very much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you.